of Latin American Studies here at UT, Lila Spinson. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the inauguration of the Ernesto Cardinal Cathedra. So I'd like to say a little bit about this. If you're not sure what um, what this is about, what a cathedra is, uh, just a few a few words about that. Uh, in November of 2016, Ernesto Cardinal, who's a poet, priest, and political activist, visited the University of Texas at Austin. He met with students and professors, and he looked at some of the bibliographic gems that we have in the Benson Latin American Collection. And he ended uh, his visit with a reading in the main reading room of the Benson of his own poetry and work. Uh, this event celebrated the Benson's acquisition of Father Cardinal's papers, which contained the personal correspondence, the literary first drafts, the photographs, and other materials produced by one of the leading and most prolific intellectuals that Latin America produced in the 20th century. It was that evening rehashing with Sergio Ramirez, one of our guests today, and Luz Marina Acosta, uh, after the poetry reading that we started to imagine uh, something that we call the Catedra Ernesto Cardinal, which is a scholarship and a lecture series to promote the use of the collection and to focus attention on Central American studies, if we can call it that, at the University of Texas. And so that is what we are here today to commemorate and to celebrate. The idea of the Catedra is to advance three goals. The first is to st stimulate the discussion and circulation of ideas around the history, the culture and politics of Central America, and the very pressing challenges that it faces. I can't think of a better way to do this than to uh, begin to accomplish this goal by introducing this conversation between our two guests, Luis Guillermo Solis and Sergio Ramirez. The second is to promote the scholarly use of our now very remarkable Central American collection housed at the Benson. These include, the, of course, the Ernesto Cardinal papers, the Antonio, Pablo Antonio Cuadra papers, the Arturo Tadesena Flores collection, the Roberto Carpio Nicole papers, just to name a few. It's just a, just a, a, a small piece of what we have. Two fellowships have already been awarded will be awarded every year to conduct research in the Benson specifically focused on Central America. We have already awarded the first two fellowships and the next call for applications will soon be available online. So we're very excited about that. Last but not least, the Catedra is meant to honor Ernesto Cardinal for his work as poet, priest, thinker, activist, and politician. Father Cardinal turned 94 just last week. Although he's now frail of body and discouraged by the crumbling political situation in Nicaragua, he has not lost the sense of his sense of wonder toward the universe and his love of humanity. Um, and so it's now my great honor to inaugurate this series along with our guest, Sergio Ramirez, the former vice president of Nicaragua, longtime friend and colleague of Father Cardinal, and one of Latin America's most celebrated authors. We are equally honored to present uh, president Luis Guillermo, Luis Guillermo Solis, Costa Rica's most recent former president, a politician and political scientist who is himself a longtime admirer of Father Cardinal and of his work. So before we properly begin, I'd like to uh, give a shout out and thanks to our sponsors. This event is co-sponsored by the Latin American Initiative at Texas Law, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the College of Liberal Arts, UT Libraries, and the President's Office at the University of Texas at Austin. I'd also particularly like to recognize and thank our donors to this event who've really made it possible. Our, our strong supporters, Maria Farahani, Arturo Lacayo, David and Tanya Wells, Maria and Darren Woody, and as ever, to our guiding lights, Joe and Terry Long. So, I'll invite the three people who will soon open our conversation. This event will be moderated by Gordon D. Smith, who's CEO of Strategic Insight Group. He's a specialist in intelligence, foreign policy, and global change. He works in the areas of transactional investment intelligence, geopolitical and change risk analysis, and media and cultural production is founder, principal, and CEO of, the, of a private intelligence agency, Stra uh, Strategic Insight Group. He has worked in over 90 countries around the world. He is creator, executive producer, and host of the Real Vision television documentary series called A World on the Brink with D. Smith, which premiered on PBS in April of 2018. Currently, he is vice chair of the Advisory Council of Leela Spenson. He is a permanent member of the Council of Foreign Relations in New York, a member of the Bretton Woods Committee in Washington, D.C., 
is involved with many other policy and cultural organizations. And as I say, he will serve as the moderator of this, uh, this discussion. <clears throat> Second, I'd like to uh, introduce to you Luis Guillermo Solis. He is a politician educator and politician. He served as president of Costa Rica from 2014 to May of 2018. A native of San Jose, Solis studied at the University of Costa Rica where he received academic honors. He then went on to earn his master's in Latin American studies from Tulane University. After years in academia, he moved into politics, serving as an official of Costa Rica's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as ambassador for Central American Affairs and director of foreign policy. A self-identified progressive, he ran for president in 2014 as a member of the center leftist Citizens Action Party PAC on a platform of anti-corruption, major infrastructure investment, improvement in to the already good national health care and social security systems. He also vowed to keep Costa Rica environmentally friendly and to reform current trade agreements. Solis received his mandate with over 77% of the vote, the largest margin ever recorded for an election in Costa Rica, which I have to note is the nation's uh, Latin America's largest, uh, not largest, not largest anything, is it? Uh, <laughs> the nation's uh, oldest continuous democracy, Latin America's uh, oldest continuous democracy. In addition to his political career, Solis has author authored over 10 books and written many articles for academic journals, newspapers, and magazines in various languages. Sergio Ramirez is a Nicaraguan writer and intellectual who served in the, in the junta of the National Reconstruction Government as vice president from 1984 to 1990. Born in Mazatepec, Ramirez received his law degree from the National Autonomous University of León, Nicaragua, where he retained the gold medal for best student. He then went on to found the well-known magazine Ventana and actively participated in the resistance movement against the Somoza family. In 1977, he became a member of Los Doce the Twelve, a group of intellectuals, businessmen, priests, and civil society members who publicly supported the Sandinista Liberation Front and its struggle to overthrow the Somoza presidency. With the revolution's victory, he became a member of the new government, first serving over the National Council of Education and then as vice president of Nicaragua. After differences with the leaders of the party, which I think it's safe to say have continued, Ramirez founded the Movimiento de Renovación Sandinista on the platform of democratic reform. After an unsuccessful bid for the presidency, Ramirez retired from politics and returned to academia and the literary world, where he has achieved international recognition. He's been awarded the Afa Guarda, Guarda Prize, the Carlos Fuentes Prize, and the very prestigious Miguel de Cervantes Prize, which he won last year. He's currently a columnist for La Prensa in Nicaragua, as well as other newspapers around the world. So, I will now turn, the, turn our events over to Dee Smith. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And thanks to my two distinguished vis visitors for joining us. We appreciate your being here. Central America, like so much of the world, is in crisis today. The epicenter of this crisis is Nicaragua, but it expands out to encompass the entirety of the Central American uh, area. Um, just since last spring, Nicaragua has entered a period of dramatically increased problems and is in danger of becoming a failing state. But it, as I say, it, it really spans across the entire area. The so-called Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras are hit by waves of criminal violence, gang activity, narco trafficking. This is driving families and legitimate businesses out of the country. And it's contributing to the migration problem to the, not only to the north, but also to the south. 
is one of the things we're going to discuss. Costa Rica itself is beset by security problems and debt issues, um, including the refugee problem from Nicaragua. Panama continue, continue, uh, continues to struggle with money laundering and other criminal activities. And in, to make the whole situation more complex, both China and Russia have entered the fray with loans, infrastructure projects, and what we would call in the intelligence world influence operations. Um, in other words, very um, uh, significant media for um, uh, the population to try to persuade them in one way or another. Across the region, there's growing citizen dissatisfaction with the political class. There is urbanization. There are um, uneducated, undereducated, and unemployed youth. Um, sometimes there's a large percentage of the population. There are structural problems of endemic uh, in, and um, uh, widespread inequality. And that is all made more visible by the social media and the hyper-connected world we live in today. So it's not a pretty picture like so much of the world. Um, but today we, we want to try to shed some light on this issue. And so uh, since um, Nicaragua is indeed the epicenter right now. Sergio, I'd like to start with you. What's going on in Nicaragua? How did it start? How has it developed? Where do you think it is now? Well, I think we're living through uh, the most uh, important crisis the country has went through since the end of the Contra War in the, in the 90s. Uh, I, 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 uh, I am right, perhaps, uh, President Juan said that Central America has not lived another crisis like this, uh, no, like this one in many, many years. Um, the Ortega's regime, till April uh, last year, uh, had a, an understanding with the private enterprise, had uh, the uh, indifference of the government of the United States, the indifference of the international uh, community to what was happening in Nicaragua. And what was happening in Nicaragua was the consolidation of an authoritarian regime. Nobody paid attention to, uh, to that until the situation erupted in April with the civil rebellion, which the country had not seen since the civil war that uh, deposed Somoza in in 1979, uh, as a result of this uh, eruption, now we can count more than 400 people killed in the street, especially June people. Uh, we have more than, more than 600 people in jail, June people too. And uh, only in Costa Rica, more than 40,000 people exiled went into exile to Costa Rica because uh, Costa Rica has been always the, uh, uh, the better place for Nicaraguan refugees uh, along, along the, 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 the history. The problem is now how this situation is going to be solved. Uh, and the, for the people of Nicaragua, it is the first time in our history in which is civil war is not contemplated as a solution. Along the history of Nicaragua, all crises provoked by a, dictator, a dictatorship have been solved by a war, by a confrontation that produced the, uh, the, the triumph of an uh, insurgent force, and the leader of this insurgent force uh, become the new leader of the country, and a, a new dictatorship is engendered. Now it is the first time in which we are reflecting about the way of getting out of this situation without any armed confrontation. It is very important because if we get this solution, uh, we can find uh, the way out of uh, this uh, permanent phenomenon of uh, dictatorships always repeating the history of the country and to have for the first time an institutional way out of the, of, the, of the crisis, to create new institutions, and to make possible for the first time in the history of the country that institutions 
can have more weight than individuals. That is crucial for the, for the country. We don't want uh, either to have uh, a coup d'etat. We don't have the intervention of the army to, to give a so-called solution to this problem. The intervention of uh, the army is never positive for any country in Latin America. Uh, and third, we uh, neither want a military intervention for any for any foreign power. Then we want a pacific solution, a democratic transition. We need the attention of the international communi community, the pressure of the international community to get this solution, but it must be a solution given for, uh, by the Nicaraguan people itself. So how do you see that working in the sense of from going from where we are now into a solution that does not involve some kind of armed conflict within the country. How, how, would that, how could that play out most effectively? First, we need the consolidation of uh, internal, internal force. Uh, uh, <coughs> one of the weakness of this situation uh, was uh, one at, at the same time of the positive, positive point of this situation is that uh, the rebellion of, uh, that started back in April last year was not conduced for the first time for any pol traditional political force. Was uh, the rebellion of young people without any political leadership, traditional political leadership, and it is a, pro it is the, a problem, but uh, it is an advantage to, uh, to build a new kind of leadership. I suppose the new leaders of the country are now in jail, are now in exile, are now in hiding. But uh, what I, as uh, Nicaraguan, as uh, my, my aspiration as a Nicaraguan citizen is to have a different kind of leadership, a young leadership, uh, like it's just like uh, happening in Venezuela with a new young leader. So just to back up for a moment for the edification of, every, of everyone here, what precipitated, what was the cause of, of, the, of the uprising in April? What, why did it happen then? What, what, what suddenly made it into something that was, a, that, was that kind of uprising? Abuse. Abuse of power. Uh, the government, uh, uh, Ortega, thought that uh, he has the power enough to impose over the people economic measures that were unpopular. And uh, he thought that he could repress any uh, uh, popular reaction, and he couldn't, because uh, the young people came to the street by thousands, and uh, he couldn't control the situation, uh, except when he brought to the street paramilitary forces because the police was enough to control the, the civil re rebellion. And then the paramilitary, paramilitary forces, masked forces, armed with uh, war weapon, came to kill people. And this is the reason why we have more, a, a, a toll of more than 500 people killed. So, uh, Luis, how is, the situation in Nicaragua affecting the whole of Central America, uh, you know, Costa Rica in particular, but more generally as well? Yes, of course. Well, before <coughs> I address the question, I would like to, on behalf of Sergio and myself, thank Nilis Benson and the University of Texas in general, and all of you for, for having us. It's a great honor, a great pleasure being here. We've had a wonderful day with the students and the faculty um, of the Central Latin American Studies from the libraries of the university, and it's truly a great to, to see how you work and continue to be engaged in, in, in studying and learning about the Central American reality, which is, gets lost uh, many times in, when we speak about this in, in Latin America. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, the, the impact of, um, of the Nicaraguan crisis upon uh, central, the rest of Central America can, it's, can, can be deep and, and could be long-lasting if it's not solved uh, correctly. Uh, Sergio has already mentioned one direct impact uh, in Costa Rica, which is the number of, of migrants and, and refugee seekers that have come, as it is the case or has been the case in the past, every time the country uh, to our north 
becomes entangled in, a, in, a civil, in civil strife. Um, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It, it has been there for uh, since the 19th century, but the numbers have risen quite significantly since then. And uh, I think we've been fortunate <coughs> to have a, a, a very large Nicaraguan uh, and Nicaraguan descent population in Costa Rica, probably totally in 400,000, 500,000, most of whom are uh, there uh, legally. Uh, and others who are not come and go. Uh, we, we have a, a very porous border. Uh, uh, I'm talking in a place where you know what that means. Um, and uh, and that, that, that situation is, is, a, is a permanent situation. Uh, hundreds of people go back and forth in that border. They share a, a border culture. They eat the same way. They love in the same way. Um, and therefore, it is an exchange that, that we've had, but the, in, the ultimate, in the ultimate period, uh, the, the, um, the violence in, in Nicaragua, the repression of the regime uh, has forced you know, more than 40,000. Uh, I've heard numbers going as high as 56,000 um, Nicaraguans into, into Costa Rica. That's one, one, one aspect. And, and this is repeated, mind you. Uh, lots of Nicaraguans fleeing to Honduras, fleeing to El Salvador. So it's, it's not only Costa Rica. The, the only impact, the other impact is, has to do with trade. Uh, Nicaragua is almost in the middle of Central America. So everything that goes from the south, trade-wise, to the northern countries, and there is a very significant regional market, gets stuck there. So it cannot move. And this is very important. And Nicaragua is the second, third largest uh, uh, trade partner of Costa Rica, and it's a very important uh, market for, for Panama as well. So. Um, not having the opportunity to, 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 to open uh, that, uh, that clog uh, is difficult, uh, makes, makes trade very difficult. And obviously there's another issue, which is the geopolitical factor, and particularly uh, in what respects to Russia. We, during my administration, I alerted several times, even at the podium at the United Nations, uh, of remilitarization of Nicaragua, the refurbishing of the Nicaraguan armed forces by, by Russia. Uh, and they were doing this plain sight. And this was not secret. I mean, there were uh, warships of, of Russia stationed in, in, in Bluefields in the Caribbean side of, of Nicaragua. Uh, the Russians uh, built a uh, police academy in Managua, which is, you know, um, operative. Uh, and, and then they reformed all the... So, so this entanglement also has to do with what's going on inside Nicaragua. And it's good that we, we mention it because there is a, a, an extra regional dimension as it is generally the case in Central America, that needs to be taken care of as well. So what do you, in, in terms of the migration issue in, in uh, Central America as a whole, how much do you think that impacts local or regional politics and the politics within each country? Is it, is it a, a divisive thing like it has been in, let's say, Germany or other places? Uh, is, it, is it something that's, that is not quite as... as, as um, Fractious as it might be, uh, how does that how does that work in in the various countries of Central? Well, to America? be honest with you, I, I don't know what the situation is in El Salvador or Honduras <coughs> with, with Nicaraguan migrants. In Costa Rica, there was a small uh, outburst of, of uh, xenophobia uh, around the May, month of May uh, and no August, September of August of last year, and we immediately uh, got on top of it. And even the former presidents of Costa Rica, we all. Unified to issue two videos, uh, making you know, clear that that we had been a country of refuge and that we should not uh, sacrifice that uh, that tradition, um, and it's under control now. Um, but it, it is a it is a, a, a something that needs to be kept uh, under control, largely by the government being prudent in dealing with this, using the right language, um, making it clear that there is a. a a gentler side to immigration uh, than the traditional view that puts a lot of, uh, of emphasis on differences and on, on, on lies, you know, about the numbers, about the threat, about the security, about how dangerous they are, you know, that they're all about to take the country from within. And, you know, in a country where the Nicaraguan uh, labor force has been so important for the, the buildup of our GDP, where Nicaraguan ladies take care of our children and, and the households of Costa Ricans in large numbers. And to, to, to think that there is a, a 
some sort of uh, you know, conspiracy coming from Nicaragua because of immigration is just absurd. So I think uh, we've been able to, to lead, uh, to, to deal with this in, in an intelligent, decent, humanitarian, uh, responsible manner. And I, again, I'm not saying that xenophobia and bad traits do not exist. They're there. They're used for political purposes. But fortunately, they've been uh, quenched so far. And that's a, a really positive outcome that every country can't claim to of have. Of course. Absolutely. Have, have done. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so uh, really a question for, for both of you, but Sergio, I'd like to start with you. Uh, in terms of, of security and in terms of the, the definition that, um, that the populace has of where its security concerns are, how big a role does the uh, growing lack of faith in government and in uh, lack of faith for uh, you know, the governing class, the, the establishment, what have you, how do you think that plays into um, what's going on in Central America as a whole? Well, uh, till uh, the eruption of the crisis in Nicaragua last year, uh, we used to, to trace an uh, imaginary line dividing Central America between northern countries and southern countries. Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras were, were the most insecure countries because of the pandillas, the mobs, the drug trafficking, the border between Mexico and Guatemala is a very hot border because of the concentration of uh, organized crime there. Um, uh, in Nicaragua happened to have uh, one of the lowest uh, rates of uh, criminality in Central America, along with Costa Rica and Panama. Now this situation has completely changed. The focus of insecurity in Central America is concentrated now in Nicaragua, not in Honduras or, or El Salvador. Potentially, the situation in Nicaragua can reach any other country <coughs> in, uh, in Central America, even when we don't have a, 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 an armed confrontation. This is a no, not a violent confrontation. It is a, the aggression of an abusive and authoritarian government uh, against uh, unarmed people. But uh, the, 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 the danger that this situation could evolve into a military confrontation, a violent confrontation, is there. And then violent confrontations in a country like Nicaragua that, as President Sol said, is situated in the real center of Central America, uh, is going to irradiate to the, re the rest of the region like in, like in, the, in the 80s. Uh, the war in the 80s affected all Central America. Affected uh, from Guatemala to Costa Rica to, to, to Panama. And then uh, we have now this risk of a confrontation that could affect the whole Central American region. And uh, what do you think is um, is the, the role and the um, importance of uh, criminal activity in undermining the the, the uh, social fabric and the, and the governmental fabric? I mean, we we know that we know from other parts of the world that uh, a state in in serious problems, a failing state, let's say, can infect everything around it, as you say. Uh, and that can enable the growth of criminal activity. There's already a lot of criminal activity, particularly in the Northern Triangle, but in other areas as well. How do you see that playing out? No, absolutely. I, I, and, and, but you have, we have to, to, to take into account that there are two sides of that coin. On the one hand, we have the forces that use Central America, which you can see in that map as a bridge. It has been a bridge since the Pleistocene era, you know, for species and, and human travel, et cetera, um, for, for trafficking drugs. And, uh, and Central America and the Caribbean uh, represent or, or are, the, are the region where, or is the region where 90% of the cocaine that comes into the United States travel. So it's, it's, not, it's, not a small, it's not a small issue. You have all these forces that are, uh, are, are, have used Central America to that effect. And the growth or the enhancement of, uh, of coca plantations in Colombia and the production, it has tripled in the last few years, 
has meant for the Central American countries uh, a very serious situation. The, the growth uh, in very fast and, 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 and very exponentially, uh, exponential growth of local cartels, which amount for most of the violence that you see in the streets. In the case of Costa Rica, I, I could not, uh, unfortunately, keep the numbers down. It's still very, very low con in compar comparison to the region. But still, I mean, we went from nine, nine per hundred thousand killings in 2013 to, to 12 per 100,000 killings in 2018. And that, but if you deduct from those numbers, the numbers of non, the killings not related to drug activities, you, you, you have to get rid of 60% of the number. So we come back to 9%, which is the Uruguayan number. Now, so the, the weight of that is, is large, but also the, the impact upon local government, the offices of the administration of justice, the police force, which gets contaminated by, by corruption. So the, the impact is, 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 is wide and, and deep. Now, the other part of the coin has to do with the internal conditions that facilitate narco-trafficking. Mind you, there is a, a market issue with the United States that everybody recognizes and, and Europe. I mean, the drug continues to be an issue because there are markets where it's received. That's, that's not contested anymore. I mean, the United States has acknowledged that now for a long, long time. Uh, but there is this other internal factor. Why is it that it has been so easy for the drug cartels, the international drug cartels, to take a hold of Central America? And that has to do with, with the, the uh, absence of state authority over significant regions uh, of, of our, our countries, particularly in the coastlines and in the borders. Uh, it has to do with young people out of work and not studying the ninis, uh, as they're called, being available. They're, they're a cheap labor force that's, that's there to be, to be dealt with. It has to do with availability of guns, especially small guns, and I'm not gonna mention the country where many of these country guns come from. And, and also the lack of, uh, of, co of social cohesion. Because you can make a, a, a very good case for social fragmentation, the lack of networks that uh, can handle young populations from very early ages on. That was one of the secrets of the Nicaraguan low criminality rates, the fact that they had family networks that could take care of the children. Because you know, the, 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 the other countries in, that were with high rates uh, had conditions very similar to Nicaragua, and yet in Nicaragua, the, the, the criminality rates were low. So uh, we have to see it integrally, but the, the impact uh, upon the, 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 the political system in general uh, is very significant. Do, do you see, again, question for both of you, do you see the, um, the, the um, fragmentation of the criminal um, drug, drug trafficking gangs into other kinds of criminality as they're kind of, you know, expanding out of that and, and, and um, uh, beginning to, to enter other areas that they, they become criminalized to do drug crime and then they begin to get into kidnapping and so forth. And so the whole thing kind of mushrooms in that way. Is that something that? Well, I think the most dangerous thing is corruption because the, the, the amount of money just the part, huh? they, they have the, the, the trafficking cartels have an enormous amount of money. You can imagine. Uh, you can't put in real terms what that have, uh, represents. This enormous amount of money to buy everyone, from judiciary uh, functionaries to uh, bureaucrats, um, everyone. They, they become politicians, and uh, the the laundry money business is affecting Central America too. It is uh, enormous uh, business. Then corruption, uh, <coughs> money laundry, and uh, the simple fact that uh, we are there. Central America is a bridge uh, for the drug coming from the south to the north. We are, and we, are, we are going always to be there, unfortunately. We, are, we have two enormous coasts, the Pacific coast, the, the Caribbean coast. Uh, the drug is coming not only from Colombia, but from Venezuela too. Mm -hmm. to Jamaica. To, from Jamaica, 
uh, going through all the Central American countries uh, to Mexico and then from Mexico from Mexico to to to, to the United States. Then it is uh, a very serious problem. Yeah, yeah. But you, you mentioned uh, other other organized criminal activities, and definitely they're all related. Uh, for example, Maras in El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala are not involved in the, they're not cartels, but they work to distribute drugs. In and, the, connect and, and, and connect them now. And uh, connect them now. But then you, you go, if, if you look at the human trafficking uh, r routes to the United States, and North, they are the same one that the drugs continue to, to, uh, to use. Uh, the drug cartels use uh, kidnappings as uh, flujo de caja, cash flow for, for their activities when the situation gets complicated in the drug market. So there are all sorts of illegal, illicit uh, businesses that are related to the, drug, uh, uh, to the drug deals, including obviously cultural smuggling, uh, the smuggling of species uh, running, uh, taken away from, from Central America to the markets in the north, etc. So there are uh, multiple uh, channels that that link the drug traffic with with, with other. But the, the, the drug cartels uh, are concentrating in their hands all the criminal activities in the in the Central American area, uh, from prostitution to children and gambling, trafficking, uh, gambling, everything is in their hands. So before we turn uh, it over to the audience for questions, and I know there are lots of people with questions here, let's just talk briefly about the outside actors in Central America. You mentioned the Russians, um, and uh, the Chinese are very active. And I think it would be interesting to hear some thoughts from both of you on uh, what the, you feel is going on with the Chinese and the Russians, and also what are the attitudes towards what the US is doing or, or not doing in the area now? So. Um, Please. Well, I think the Chinese uh, interests are uh, uh, growing in Central America and in Latin America in, in, in a general sense. But not in Nicaragua. Chinese are out of, of, of Nicaragua. Nicaragua is uh, one of the few countries in Latin America that uh, has official relations with Taiwan, not uh, with China. When Ortega invented this uh, uh, story about the inter <coughs> interoceanic canal, canal, it was a complete liar. Uh, it, it, it has anything to do with uh, the government of China, with the strategic interest of China, because the China is in the ca Panama Canal now. They, they don't need another canal in Central America. It was an invention. I, I really don't know why Ortega invented this uh, story about the, uh, this uh, a Chinese entrepreneur, Wang Jing, that one day appeared in Nicaragua saying that he, he was going to, to expend uh, $50 billion in building a, a canal through Nicaragua. This uh, was cra completely crazy. Uh, many people believe that, there was, that th this was uh, real, but it was a complete invention. And after so many years, many years has passed, and the, the canal is not there. And uh, Wang Jing disappeared. He got broken in, in China and, uh, and disappeared completely. The Russian, the Russian has, a, I would say, limited interest in, in, in Nicaragua because they are talking about uh, uh, satellite installation in the country, communication installation, uh, uh, strategic uh, communication systems, or bringing uh, the, the, the Chinese military flow to to the ports of Nicaragua, uh, all of that what, uh, was a complete invention too. Then, we are not in the midst of, of a new uh, Cold War in, in, in the Caribbean, in Central America, like in the past. Uh, I think it is a, a problem of this, of uh, a, a very different problem than which the one we are confronting in Nicaragua. Now, it is a traditional dictatorship that has a different ideological sign. Ortega says that he's a, a revolutionary man from the left, but the, the, the shape of, of his uh, dictatorship it is uh, equal or similar to the many dictatorships 
we have known in Latin America during the, during the, 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 the last century. Uh, I, I, well, I'll already talk about the Russians. I think the Russians continue to use Central America and Nicaragua in particular to tease the United States. And, and you see how they come here and they issue uh, a number of actions and then they seem to, to say, you know, at the United States, uh, wh wh what about Crimea? Huh? Are, are you going to bother us there? Or what about Georgia? Are you going to continue? You know, it's kind of a token negotiation there. They, they have experience in doing that. There's no strategic interest on the part of the Russians. Now, the Chinese, it's interesting because the impact of Chinese policy, uh, diplomatic uh, actions in Latin America over the last year has been important. Paraguay, which was a, s a stronghold of Taiwan in, and one of the largest countries that kept relations with Taiwan, broke relations with Taiwan and started them with China. And then we have El Salvador, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and, and, and well, Costa Rica that had established relationships with the, the People's Republic of China 10 years ago that are now uh, in, in, uh, with, with full relationships with, with Peking, Beijing. So the only three countries that are left out of eight that, uh, that Beijing had are Belize, well, four countries, Belize, uh, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. and Nicaragua. So the, the change has been significant. But then again, one wonders what, what does re this really means. I mean, the real interest of the Chinese is lays in Panama, clearly. They have announced that they have over 21 projects uh, in Panama, and Panama is going to be the center part of the, uh, the, the centerpiece of, of Chinese uh, activities in the Americas. Uh, how, what that means but specifically, we don't know because they have these huge numbers that are presented. They have the control of the two ports in they Panama. They already have the control, but one of the, of, of the, of the, of the ports is... Colón and Panama, uh, they, they have, have the, the administration. And, and, but one of them is Taiwanese still, so they, you know, you have... But they, they have said that they're going to have these strategic developments, more ports, airports, a train, uh, a number of things, as part of the Silk Road initiative. Which is strange. And the, the, which, the, the, which, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to it be sounds Eurasia, huge. and now it's... It's cool. Eurasia, and now it's this. And so it sounds huge, but the real, the real beef, uh, mind you, should not talk about beef here, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the real issues that they are putting forth, we don't know how far they're going to be uh, taken by, 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 by uh, China in reality. The other thing is, even with China doing these things, the regional hegemon remains the United States. I mean, there's no question about it. Half of our exports, half of our imports come and go to the United States. Culturally, uh, service-wise, tourism that comes to Central America. Can, the, the United States continue to be the largest partner. The financial so, The financial institutions, the money, the investments, the majority comes from the United States. So I think we have to be uh, careful um, and caution the real significance that China can have. Now, we can think of you know, the long term, and they think in the long term, and that's interesting to see. But if the United States would have a more, a more engagement in the region and a more creative and imaginative uh, policy towards the region, I mean, the Chinese would not find spaces large enough to, to shoo away the United States. That doesn't seem likely to happen in the short or even medium term. Well, of course, I mean, what the, the key issue, issue that I think China is, is trying to address here and the key thing to understanding China's situation is that China just cannot provide for its own food and it cannot provide for its own energy. It all has to be imported. They, don't even, they can't even provide for the foodstuffs for their animals to, to feed their population. And so securing the canal zone is a, is a key area, the, the Panama, because it, you know, the canal's in the middle of Panama. It, it, it's a key element of, of not only a, a Central American strategy, but a strategy that has to do with global supplies into China to keep its population from, you know, essentially boiling over with, uh, uh, you know, anger over lack of supplies and so forth. So I think that's, that's part of it. But, um, but I, you know, I also think that, that China, this is a matter of some debate in the geopolitical world, but China may be doing what you're saying Russia is doing, in that, you know, they've now gotten very 
upset about U.S. activities in the South China Sea and the, the, the areas that they want to establish sovereignty over. So they may be pushing a bit in Latin America in order to, you know, quid pro quo kind of thing for that. That's, that's one idea about what they're doing. But in terms of the U.S., as you say, it is the regional hegemon. What is the attitude now towards the U.S. in, in Central America? I mean, is it positive, negative, neutral? Where, where, how does that play out? Well, uh, I think in Nicaragua, uh, they have a very clear uh, attitude now, just now, against uh, the Ortega regime. It is very clear. It, it, it started as uh, part of the lobby of the Cuban American uh, representatives in Florida, but, but it extended to all the political uh, system in Washington. Uh, just now, there is an um, understanding and agreement between uh, Republicans and Democrats against Ortega. Uh, this uh, NICA Act uh, that was, was passed unanimously in the Congress and in the Senate. Um, uh, we, we, we can say that now it is uh, the intention of the will of some representatives of the uh, Florida area related to the Cuban American Committee and all. This is uh, the unanimous attitude of the political uh, uh, Washington against Ortega as a human violator or uh, as a violator of human rights, as someone incompatible with uh, 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 Western values and so on. Not because he's a communist, not because he's a leftist uh, 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 dictatorship, but because he, he has. Uh, he is uh, interrupting the, the normal life in Central America. Uh, every, everyone is seeing it, uh, seeing Ortega in this, uh, in, in this way. And this, and this is the attitude of the European community too. And uh, the Organization of American States and uh, uh, everyone in the international community is saying, uh, saying Ortega under the same light. You know, a few years ago, I proposed in, in a book that, that I published with Francisco Rojas that American U.S. Uh, intervention in, in the Caribbean base happened in cycles of inter in, in, intervention and neglect. And we made a, you know, a whole line of time in which we talked about it and explained this. It was not necessarily a new idea, but I think we, we, we used it to explain the, the situation in the Central American crisis. Uh, the last cycle of intervention of strong American proposals for the region occurred with the Clinton administration with the Colombia, with Plan Colombia. That was the last time. And, and since then, what we've seen is the United States getting, administering in Central America, what I have called in other occasions a negative agenda. That is an agenda basically based on fear. Once again, uh, just stopping things that could damage American interests. Immigration, drugs, uh, protectionism, terrorism. terrorism. So th this was, this was uh, something that we've discussed. Some analysts have, have a uh, look into it in, in greater detail. And as long as you have a negative agenda, then the space for creativity and ima imagination and thinking out of the box is limited. So uh, my, my fear is if we don't do something to go beyond that, we're going to stick with this because uh, the, the, the logic of seeing the United States uh, entrenched in Simismal, you know, just looking inward, is very complicated when you have such a region that is nat the natural ally of the United States in, in, in geopolitical terms. And I'm not talking about the Caribbean, but Central Latin America as a whole. So uh, the, the, uh, uh, we need to, to move beyond that negative agenda, and I think we could if... Uh, for example, we go back at least to what was the understanding we had at the end of the Clinton administration, voiced by Vice President Gore, that we were not going to get aid, but trade. And that that was going to sort of substitute what had been the traditional tool of American uh, cooperation with Central America in a financial and a, and a, and a, and a sense. So uh, the idea that, and I, I 
by the way, I was a very serious opponent of the Central American U.S. Dominican Republic Free Trade Agreement. I, I was among those who for a long time opposed CAFTA until, in the case of Costa Rica, it was approved in a referendum. So if the people voted in favor of it, there was no, no way I could kept on that position. But now, <laughs> nowadays, it's even being possibly questioned by the United States, just as NAFTA was. And this is a, a treaty that different from CAFTA. It's completely favorable to the United States, I mean, it's, uh, and, and for the rest of Central America. So if that is curtailed, then the problem is going to go further into a, 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 negative, in a, neg a negative perspective. We don't want that. So uh, how we engage in new ways, what kinds of, of programs we have to keep up with, uh, for example, the Fulbright program, which allows for the construction of, bi of, 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 of bridges, uh, cultural and so on, soft diplomacy, arts, uh, Spanish being spoken, English being taught, uh, the possibility of education. I don't know. You know we have to start you know, looking at other angles of the issue because otherwise uh, it, it's not going to look nice in a, in a few years. Well, thank you. Let's open it up for questions from the audience. And um, uh, when you're called on, um, please stand up and wait for the microphone to be taken to you. Uh, and identify yourself with your name and your institutional affiliation. Most important, please make your questions questions and not statements. And please make them short and concise. And please make them about Central America. As many problems as there are all <laughs> over Latin America, we're not here to talk about Venezuela or Mexico or so many Brazil roads. or all those places. <laughs> Um, so, and finally, we are live streaming this, so please speak slowly and enunciate so that our audiences all around the world can hear this and, and enjoy your question. So, um, show of hands, who would like to ask a question? Yes. Um, hi, I'm... I'm from the University of Texas at the uh, physics department. I have a question for President Solis. You mentioned that you would want to go back to the mindset of Gore, trade, not aid. But you also said that um, you were an opponent of the free trade agreement before the referendum. And so I was hoping you could explain that uh, seeming mismatch. Yeah, no, but, but, well, I opposed it until, until the referendum came about and then Having been the, the, the will of, of the majority of Costa Ricans, uh, I had to, to abide by that. I mean, we, we called the referendum precisely to know what the majority of the people uh, wanted because it was a very divisive issue in Costa Rica. And largely my opposition didn't have to do with free trade in general, but with that trade, free trade agreement in particular because I felt we were getting the short end of, of the treaty and the United States was getting a lot of, 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 of the advantages. Now, once the treaty was approved, then I think, it, at least in Costa Rica, we've been trying to do a good use of it. And, and for example, uh, our, our free trade zone production in, uh, has moved from manufacturing of electronics, which was already on the way in, in, at the time of the, when, when, the, when the treaty was approved, to uh, the building of sophisticated medical equipment, which is sent to the United States in, in very good conditions. Same thing can be said about services. Same thing can, can be said about investments. Costa Rica, we have over you know, 2,500 different uh, in, 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 uh, investments in the country, most of which come from the United States. Most of the largest companies that produce medical devices are now in Costa Rica, St. Jude's and Boston Scientific, et cetera. Uh, Intel uh, has moved their, their manufacturing operations to Vietnam, but they kept their labs in Costa Rica. So we're at the verge of, of turning that into a research and development center for Intel, which is great. So, I mean, if you, if you think of a, a, a free trade in a different way, and you have, as we do in Costa Rica, national policies that would deal with issues that could become negative uh, in, in free trade if you did not have them. Social security laws, uh, stable economy, education, etc., cetera, then uh, it would be diff different, but, but that's not the case. So we have been able to, to turn it around a bit. So what seems to be a contradiction, contradiction is not, is simply something that, that needed to be done and, and then it was our responsibility as politicians and policymakers to, to take, make it into advantage, an advantage for the country. 
What was it? Was it uh, Mark Twain who first said, "When the facts change, I change my mind"? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have former president of Costa Rica, Ricardo Jimenez, who used to say that solo los ríos no se devuelven, only rivers do not flow back. But no, no, that's not the logic. I think that there are opportunities that, that can be found, that were found, and we are using it to the advantage of the country's national interests. Another question? Yes, in the red spot. I would like to say thank you so much for being here. It's been a very educational discussion. My name's Megan and I graduated from UT College of Liberal Arts in May 2018. And social media was briefly mentioned, but I would like for you to both comment on the government's view of social media and how it's impacted both progress and criminal activity and if there's any collaboration between government and the social media companies to try to stop criminal activity. Uh. We have a special program with social media in Nicaragua now because uh, the offensive of the government is uh, in this very moment put against the social so, social media. Um, in Nicaragua, we only have now uh, one TV station that had the, that has independent uh, criterion against the government. One. Uh, most of them have been uh, intervened, harassed by the government. Uh, we have only two newspaper, written newspaper. Uh, the authority has been retaining paper and ink uh, in the custom services for those two newspapers that only have paper to 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 to, to print uh, to be printed for. 15 years, for, for 15 days. Then, uh, uh, more sure, in one month, we are not, not going to have any, any written paper. Uh, radio station, we only, only uh, have one independent uh, radio station in Managua. This is a very critical situation. Only in Costa Rica, we have 40 uh, journalists in exile, only in Costa Rica including Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who was the, uh, the, uh, the director of two very important uh, uh, TV programs and one uh, 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 journal, uh, confiden Confidential. Uh, the most, uh, one of the most important TV station director owner is in jail now along with the, the chief of information of the, of the, of the TV station, 100% notice. This is a very critical, very critical situation. The government is in the position of abolishing free expression in, in Nicaragua. And it is uh, uh, something I'm going to, to, to talk uh, in, detail, uh, in detail tomorrow at the Night Center here at the university. Um, because uh, I, I should like to call attention for, for, this, uh, for this situation. We are in the brink of distinguishing the free press in Nicaragua. The, the media in general and social media uh, in particular remain a stalwart of democratic uh, act actions in, in Central America. With all the criticisms that politicians like myself uh, do of, 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 of media and the criticism they make of us and the role that sometimes one find, finds uh, you know, controversial regarding you know, the values of democracy and or the evaluation of democracy, etc. It would be impossible to imagine uh, the fight for democracy in Central America without the media. And so much so that so many journalists are killed every year, uh, not only in, in Central America, in Latin America and in Mexico. other parts of, the, of uh, Mexico and other parts of the world because they are the ones who are denouncing, uh, who are in the trenches. They are the first trench, in fact, uh, in many of the, uh, of the cases of corruption and, and, and denouncing uh, the uh, uh, different phenomena that, that the, the, the linkages between political power and, and illegal powers in, in, the, in the region. So I would say that they're fundamental. In the case of Nicaragua, social media is essential. Same thing, the 
It can be said about Guatemala, it can be said about uh, Honduras. The penetration of, of social media, as you know, for your studies, own studies, uh, is significant. There are six million, Sergio was saying this afternoon, six million uh, inhabitants in Nicaragua and there's six, six million cell phones. In Costa Rica, cell phones have, have doubled the population per capita. So, you know, with that kind of access to intelligent phones and everything, obviously in lieu of, uh, of free access to, to information, uh, social media has become a fundamental part of the defense of democracy. Just to expand on that point and ask a slightly different question, do you find, you had mentioned social cohesion a few minutes ago. Do you find that, uh, as is arguably the case in, in the U.S. and other, some other places, that the amount of um, social media and, and the t transparency of social media in showing different kinds of lifestyles and curated lifestyles and all this sort of thing, on the one hand, and its ability to allow people to organize into what are sometimes called tribal or neo-tribal units, on the other, that, that, that do you find that phenomenon is, is um, uh, exacerbating social division, making people more aware of uh, levels of extreme levels of inequality, making people more prone to organize into tight groups that exclude other groups. Is that phenomenon observable in, in Central America? I would say yes, because of what Sergio has said. That's the good part of it. That's the virtuous part. The downside of that is uh, have truths, post-truths, lies, outright lies, presented as truths, a fake news, and all of that, which continues to be a very serious threat to democratic stability. Because if in a, in a situation like the one we have on security issues, for example, a good politician accused of being a narco-trafficker, you kill that politician forever. And if people believe that he's a narco-trafficker, how can he deal with that if it's not, it's not true? How can you prove that an accusation made on you is not true when it's not happening? Now that kind of down, uh, of, unex of, of unintended or maybe intended consequence is a very serious thing. And I don't think the companies are helpful. You know, they've been forced to be helpful in the United States by, by rulings of law. Uh, we have not gotten there uh, in Central America yet. So if it has happened here, if it's happening as we speak in the Western demo democracies and more developed countries, imagine qua what f external impacts uh, and the misuse of, of the digital uh, world can have upon smaller nations. I mean, it's just fearful to think. So we need, and, and there's, there are no norms. We, this is a phenomenon, it's, new, it's very new, so there are no laws to regulate it. But uh, just, just a, a, a little commentary about, about social media. Uh, Perhaps uh, what uh, President Solis uh, are saying is uh, really true. The, the, the capacity of falsification social media, social media has and the polarization of opinions. Mm -hmm. You in social media don't have the opportunity to intermediate opinions, intelligent opinions, to, to variate, uh, to, to introduce variation into opinion because uh, you, you only have black and white. That is. Uh, uh, part of the reality of, uh, of the communi communication through, through intelligent phones, through, through all the social uh, networks and so on. But in Nicaragua, uh, I think social media was crucial for the civil insurrection uh, of April, Saturday, April last, uh, last year. Uh, when, one, uh, uh, when all people came to the street to protest because the social security advantages they, they have were reduced by this uh, imposition, this uh, law that Ortega was imposing, uh, the mobs came to the street to beat this, uh, these old people. And the uh, photographs and videos of uh, the mobs beating all people in the street of the city of Leon uh, came immediately, immediately to the social media, and it uh, uh, played a very crucial role for people knowing what, ha what, 
uh, what was happening in this very spot at that moment. And the, uh, this uh, produced the mobilization of all the country. Immediate, immediately it was connected to the mobilization in Managua, in Matagalpa, in other cities, and without this uh, possibility open by social media, media the, the civil insurrection in the country wouldn't have been possible. Yes. Um, okay, my name is Paloma Diaz. I work in Lila Spenson, and I have some breaking news. Uh, Lila Spenson is hosting a conference, and our annual conference is entitled Journalism Under Siege. We'll be uh, hosting journalists from Venezuela, Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Colombia, etc. Uh, February 21st and 22nd. And the breaking news is that this afternoon, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who is the director of Confidencial and the son of President Violeta Chamorro, has confirmed that he will be one of the two keynote speakers of the conference. So please join us to discuss the challenges that journalism is facing in the Americas. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes, please, go ahead. My name is Peter Cleves. Uh, I was formerly the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies. But in 1979, I was head of the Ford Foundation for Mexico and Central America. And at that time, uh, Don Sergio, I met you in Managua soon after the victory of the Sandinist forces to talk about how the Ford Foundation could provide support for the post Somoso government. At that time, you were a colleague and associate and a supporter of Daniel Ortega. Now you are not. Your journey through your reflections of making that change from being a supporter to being an opponent must have been uh, an internally contentious journey. There are other politicians in our own country that we were wishing would make a similar kind of journey. <laughs> Could you tell us the thought process that you went through judging the advantages and the risks of making the change that you made. It is a long history, <laughs> a very long history to, to give you an idea in two minutes. Uh, but uh, first, when we met in Managua, I, I was not a supporter of Ortega. I was a supporter of the revolution. And I was, I was part of that revolution. I was in the revolution. And uh, my aspiration was to have a country, a free country, a democratic country, and we didn't get that. And this is the reason why in 1995, we, we came to, to, to organize, to found a, a, different, a different party, the Movimiento Sandinista de, 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 de Renovación, Sandinist Movement of Renovation, that uh, uh, was uh, looking for a new kind of uh, revolutionary movement, a democratic movement. And we failed because the, the, the country was completely polarized between Ortega and Alemán. Alemán was the leader of the Liberal Party that uh, was, uh, is now at, uh, associated, uh, is now associated to, to, with uh, Ortega. Uh, Alemán was the one that made possible Ortega to come back to power because uh, both of them reformed the Constitution to allow Ortega to win election with 35% uh, of the vote. Uh, uh, and then I was out of this and from at that moment. I was against Ortega, and I, I, I was against uh, uh, Alemán. I think a revolution are very complicated process. And uh, <laughs> I was 10 years with the revolution, then uh, we lost election in front of Mrs. Chamorro. Uh, I was on the side of those that, uh, that uh, uh, wanted immediately to recognize the, our defeat and to turn power to Mrs. Chamorro. We turn power to Mrs. Chamorro, I think, was, was uh, one of the best moments of the, of the Sandinist Front, to have uh, uh, turn power uh, to Mrs. Chamorro, recognizing that uh, he won, uh, she won the election. And uh, after that, uh, uh, my way and the way of uh, President Ortega separated. Commander Ortega wanted violence, recuperate power by violence. I wanted to, that the Sandinist Front could uh, come back to 
to, to, to power through democratic means. And uh, this is the reason why I uh, get out of this and from. That is my story. Then I, then I lost the election in, in 1996, I present myself as a candidate for the movement of Sandinist renovation. Nobody wanted me in power. <laughs> and then I, 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 I get out, I got out, out of uh, the political arena and um, I came back to my old uh, uh, task that was uh, to be a writer and now a writer. And uh, I, if I sitting here uh, talking about Nicaragua, it is because, because not because I am a politician. I am not a politician. I am a citizen interest for the future of my country. I am, what I want for my country is democracy, is democracy <coughs> as a citizen and as a writer. Yes, at the, in the middle of the back uh, side row. Why, why don't we take a couple of, oh, okay. uh, of uh, questions? You, you and, and Yeah, we can take two together. We'll, yeah. we'll take two and then try to answer. Yeah, my name is Adriana Pacheco from the International Board of Advisors, and it is an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So could you please uh, talk about indigenous groups in Nicaragua and the region? Because I think that that is a, a group that is barely mentioned in the conversation. Okay, and, and uh, from you at the middle of the left row there. Hello, my name is Roshan Khan. I'm a 17-year-old freshman in the College of Liberal Arts, National Relations, and Global Studies. And I would like to ask, um, to what extent do you see climate change impacting the people of Central America, and particularly like farmers? And if it is a significant issue, what can be done about it given the influence of banks and corporations centered in the United States? Mm -hmm. uh, well, on, on the indigenous peoples question, uh, undoubtedly Central America has a rich uh, enormously talented, historically relevant, uh, extraordinarily uh, important population of indigenous peoples. It's very varied, obviously. Uh, Guatemala is evidently the country that has more, uh, more of a, of a heritage. Uh, Forty percent of, or sixty percent of, sixty percent, sixty percent of or more of, of the Guatemalan population is uh, indigenous. Uh, still, I mean, they have over 26 languages, or four languages and over 26 dialects out of, of the Mayan language. I mean, there is a, a tremendous impact. They have been discriminated against historically. They continue to be discriminated against. And I think that uh, they were some of the largest victims of, of the uh, policies in the 1980s, massive killings in the, uh, the highlands of Guatemala, uh, displacements of population. Uh, and, uh, and this seems to be also the case in, in Nicaragua with the mosquito populations. Um, we had a very interesting conversation today with some uh, Garifuna and mosquito populations and uh, with students in, uh, at lunch. Uh, Panama continues to be a very important uh, country for, for that has enacted policies in support of, of the indigenous populations, uh, giving them back uh, the authority over their territories. Uh, the population is not necessarily large in Panama. It's not as large as it is in, in Guatemala, but they have very significant rights uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the handling of their own affairs uh, in Las Comarcas, which is uh, something to be, to be uh, um, studied. In Costa Rica, they have been neglected for many, many years. Uh, the, the, the urban story was that we were always you know, more European than the rest of Central America, a lot of, of myths with regards to, to that. We play better soccer, but that's a different story. Uh, no, uh, not even that. But 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 uh, but the 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 need to pay attention and incorporate with respect to indigenous peoples was something that I tried to do as much as I could. And actually, we now have a protocol to honor the Article 190 of uh, Convention 190 of the uh, of the World uh, Labor or I, I International Labor Organization and other things. So I, I would say that there is progress uh, uh, overall, uh, not enough, not sufficient, um, and not fast enough in dealing with, the, uh, with, with indigenous peoples. 
which remain among the most vulnerable populations in the region. And they are pushed around quite a bit. They're pushed around by criollos, they're pushed around by criminals in, in the areas they control, mostly borders, uh, national parks where they dwell, and also the coast, the coastline of, of Central America. So one has to admit that, that it is a critical situation in which most of the, some of these uh, indigenous peoples live. And obviously, they don't have access to a lot of amenities, amenities that are now normal part of, of pu public policy, water, education, um, electricity, uh, health. Uh, in, and how to balance you know, some of the traditional ways with, with the, the, the respect for traditional way, ways to their traditional ways, uh, to uh, obligations that states have, is something that I must admit sometimes is difficult to accomplish. You know, uh, if, if they don't want a doctor in town, you have to have a doctor. And, and an imposition of that kind can become, you know, a, an issue. And so there are uh, difficulties, but, but I would say that at least there is more sensitivity to, to uh, many of their realities. And with respect to climate change, even if, as we all know, it doesn't exist, um, <laughs> we, we, we have a problem with a uh, severe problem with, with uh, overall uh, pro uh, situations de deriving from it. There is uh, what we call the ar Arco Seco in Central America that starts in the Azuero Peninsula and Panama goes all the way down into the Bajio in Mexico. That has created a number of very serious um, famines in, 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 in uh, Nicaragua and other places. Uh, the coasts of Central America are, are, are being very hardly hit by <coughs> rising seas. Uh, there is a, an upsurge of uh, something that we've always had in Central America, which are you know, national disasters or disasters. We make them for disaster, not nature. Uh, and, uh, and, and for, well, for example, Costa Rica was hit for the first time in, in its history by a hurricane uh, back in 2015, which was not expected to happen. And, and so, so there is a, an issue. And obviously, the way in which to handle that sometimes comes at odd with some of the interests of, of, uh, of some transnational cor cor companies that are, uh, continue to be um, engaged in practices that are not necessarily conducive to a very handling of climate change. We have tried in Costa Rica to be at the forefront of the international movement uh, uh, in, in respect to the Paris Accords, uh, and both in mitigation and adaptation to climate change, we have tried to, to help. But it is something that needs to be, um, and we couldn't, I, I actually proposed this on, in the Central American integration system, it needs to be handled regionally, it's not a country, only, but it is a regional responsibility, which has been difficult to, to take up. Do you want to add anything? Or? No. Okay. Okay. Something so fine with we have one more, one more set of, of two questions. So um, is you, you, yours, and then we'll do one other. Hello. I'm a student in the Cockrell School of Engineering, and I just would like to know uh, your opinion in these international commissions, for example, CC in Guatemala. What is your opinion about those commissions, or do you think these countries are uh, able to, lead, to deal with their corruption problems on their own, or do you think that there's a necessity, a real necessity of these uh, commissions? Than the things? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, I would say that it was absolutely necessary to have a such commission in, in Guatemala because the levels of corruption that are tremendously horrible, and uh, now the decision of the government to expel the member of this commission and to prohibit, to, to, uh, to uh, impede the functioning of this commission in Guatemala only show uh, the level of corruption that are in the country because they, they don't have, a, they, don't have a, they don't want any kind of fiscalization of their uh, uh, governmental activities they don't have any, con they don't want any control of corruption, and this is the reason why they have expelled this, uh, this, this commission. It is, is, uh, is uh, if we will have in Central America a full uh, uh, system, institutional system, we wouldn't need 
such uh, uh, intervention from outside in the institutional uh, affairs of our countries. But uh, unfortunately, this United Nations Commission was absolutely necessary in, in, in Guatemala. And it, I would say it would be necessary in other countries in Central America, like Nicaragua and Honduras. You know, I think we'll wrap it up with that, given uh, that, uh, that we have, uh, we're getting short on time. But I'd like to just um, ask you both for uh, one last comment. Where do we go from here? Where do you see things going? Maybe a best case and a worst case scenario. Or let's do the worst and the best. So how, how, how do you see the, the situation evolving? For the best. Okay. The best, first. Well, I would like to have a democratic change in Nicaragua in, in the shortest term possible, uh, to have new elections. Uh, what uh, President Ortega or, or the Ortega's regime should immediately accept is uh, to call elections for the people to decide who is going to govern in the country without any uh, interruption anymore and to have a regime of uh, freedom for the press, uh, freedom of, the opi of, of, of opinion, uh, freedom of organization, to return to democracy. This is the way, the only way Nicaragua could be prosperous. And the worst is that we have Ortega forever there. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll, I'll, I'll sign into what Sergio uh, has said. But allow me to, to say something else. Last night we had a wonderful reception that Elis Benson um, organized. And thank you again for having us at your home, uh, uh, Darren and Maria. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Sarita. It was uh, great and, and for, for putting it together. It was a very good occasion to, to talk a little bit and uh, meet people. And I said something that I would like to say again here. And, and that's that we should not take democracy for granted. Nobody should. We don't have the right to do so. And it, it, we, I think we've, we've grown to be too complacent with, with democracy. And we all talk about democracy. We, we talk about democracy as if it were never going to go away. It's, some, it's a given, you know. It's, well, it's not a given. It deteriorates, institutions decay, uh, values fade away, and then things that were unthinkable happen. And generally, those things that, that happen uh, are related to, uh, to rage, to uh, hatred, to uh, forgetting about each other, the breaking down of solidarity. We just forget about basic things that are at the basis of our concept of democracy, which may not be the best one, but it's the one we have. And I think it has taken us 200 years to come from the French Revolution all the way here in, or prior to that, from the Declaration of Independence through the French Revolution to where we are now. And we've learned from, from these revolutions. We know what uh, neglecting to take care of democracy uh, has, has produced. Two horrific wars, the Shoah, and, and most importantly, you know, the creation of a world order that could have destroyed the world had not been for multilateralism and, uh, and, and, and the, the creation of a network of safety for the world. And yet we continue to neglect democracy, to take it for granted and simply forget about the need to take care of it. And uh, let, let, let me uh, turn this into a, a, a bigger call uh, for responsibility and, uh, and for solidarity among, amongst all of us who believe in that. It just doesn't make sense that we forget of that fundamental civic obligation, responsibility. And it's a demand of people who have no voice. We are all privileged simply because we're here. In our different spaces, students, entrepreneurs, social activists, professors, private citizens, retired people, we, we all have that, that responsibility. And, and in my estimation, it is just too easy to forget that. So uh, let my last words be a call to action uh, in, in defense of democracy in all its wonderful, truly extraordinary shades. We, we ought to understand that premise 
that is so much central to the Constitution of the United States, which is of our uh, obligation of seek happiness for all. Thank you very much. Beautifully said.